differences are like those between chalk and cheese. If your appetite takes you to chalk, you know exactly what it tastes like. In any event, my feeling is that Trump was very much a personality and personally guided individual whose primary and indeed exclusive interest was himself and how and in what way he could prosper as a result of any particular set of engagements that he participated in. And in that regard, I think Biden is still very much a national interest person, someone who's made quite a long study of U.S.-Russian relationships and who has concluded that the nature of the relationship is such that uh, where he needs to be, he's willing to be tough and lay down a marker. But where he can, he will also attempt to open the door to a constructive conversation looking forward to further progress between the two countries. And my own uh, interests and indeed history in this particular field inclined very much in the Biden direction and very much away from the Trump direction, which sought, as far as I can recall, to accomplish nothing but uh, self-publicity, uh, often at the expense of, indeed, other people, other interests, other goals, and other activities. And so the Helsinki press conference is perhaps the epitome of that kind of an approach in which uh, he spent his time telling everybody how much he agreed with President Putin in his assessment of things as opposed to the assessment of the uh, carefully prepared and I think deeply studied version of the U.S. intelligence community, something that to my recollection had never happened before with an American president and uh, in dealing with a foreign leader in particular. Uh, so the approach at Geneva was apparently, we don't have the record of the conversation or all the documents, as opposed to the approach at Helsinki, uh, to lay down a marker on some of the things we felt most clearly strongly about, including things where uh, our differences in Ukraine were explored and our differences over Russian human rights treatment uh, among other things, uh, but as well opening the door to a number of possibilities which ended up in producing as a result of the meeting a common agreement on several things. One, uh, clearly that the two sides should go forward and discuss strategic stability. As challenging as that was in the aftermath of the withdrawal of the United States from three agreements, uh, plus uh, one more that was falling uh, into disuse and perhaps uh, 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 non-application, uh, the U.S. and Russia agreeing to speak together, uh, again, probably at the level of experts, about cyber uh, cyber in itself as a uh, practice between the two sides has uh, taken on perhaps a greater attribute of offensive cyber activities than defensive, but also leads to the potential for uh, serious misimpressions of what's going on as well as um, a process of breakdown between the two sides that could lead to greater conflict given the threats each of them have made up to and including nuclear use uh, with respect to differences over cyber. Uh, and so that piece is particularly important. It led to the immediate resuscitation of ambassadorial presences in the capitals of both countries, something that the ambassadors had been withdrawn over differences uh, coming out of things like interference in U.S. elections and so on as a part of a path forward to mention three of the most important things 
Uh, clearly, there was an exploration without any result yet of the exchange of prisoners on both sides or uh, the repatriation of prisoners, if we wish to say that, something that is a great and difficult problem uh, about which there's a significant degree of serious mistrust. Uh, we came out of the meeting far from having totally either reset or repaired the relationship, but had made a, pro a, 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 a significant amount of progress in enough things to set forth the agenda. I thought President Biden was wise in proposing the meeting, uh, wise in arranging it the way he did, joint moves to Geneva between the two, uh, wise to open the meeting to the broadest possible discussion, and very wise in arranging separate final press conferences with himself uh, reserving the opportunity to go second in the, uh, in the press conference so he could take into account what Mr. Putin had to say. Whatever he did and however he constructed it, uh, Mr. Putin uh, did not uh, seek uh, to make differences the centerpiece of his own press conference, nor uh, did he in one way or another seek to try to put down Mr. Biden or otherwise box him in or trap him, uh, and did agree that the results of the meeting were, as Mr. Biden uh, proposed in his explanation subsequently uh, to explain the results of the meeting. And those were all, I think, uh, very useful things. So uh, one can say that the press conference uh, put a little bit of uh, icing on the cake in which Biden said, so far, so good, and then in a backhanded way adopted uh, President Reagan's motto in fractured Russian, as he said, dovrai no provrai, uh, trust but verify, and promised that he would give us all some kind of judgment about real progress in six months rather uh, than immediately following the meeting. Uh, a exercise uh, in constructive diplomacy under difficult conditions, but I thought a, a very helpful one and a very useful one as far as it went. And he recognized the limits, as he does, in his own uh, effort to speak as frankly as he can to the American public in terms of both foreign and domestic affairs something that uh, was lacking in the prior administration. Well, thank you very much for that answer and for, for kicking off this discussion. Um, I think now we'll turn to John. Um, your hand is up with the question. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. And thank you again, Ambassador Pickering, for taking the time to have this discussion with us. Um, so I'll just do a brief reintroduction. Um, so I'm John, I'm a doctoral student in international relations at Indiana University. Um, and you actually touched a bit on the question I wanna ask. So I have a two part question and it refers to this, you know, the six month to a year timeline that Biden mentioned following the, the conference with Putin. Um, and my question is thinking about this, what's been called, you know, the wait and see approach. Do you view this as something that Biden is indeed thinking of as, you know, taking that six months to a year and no matter what happens, waiting until that timeline is reached to make any policy changes or final decisions on strategy towards Russia? Or is this something a bit more tentative that if there are, say, you know, protests and violent crackdowns after the Duma elections in September or some other crisis in the interim that this could be scrapped entirely and a more hardline approach is adopted? So that's the, the first part. And the second question is to the theme of pluses and minuses of this discussion, which of those two approaches, in your opinion, would be the more prudent one? Would it be to have you know, a firm timeline and say, we're not making any changes until at least six months? Or would it be to react dynamically if Russia does something that Biden and his staff do not? Um, find acceptable. 
It's a great question, John, and thank you very much because it comes to the heart of what it is we're dealing with. In a sense, it goes to the heart of the approach. Should the approach be a divided approach and keep the door open even with a serious misbehavior by Putin under circumstances which seriously agitate Russian opposition to Mr. Putin about which he would then naturally feel very much interested in finding a way to recapture uh, what he might have lost in public opinion popularity in Russia uh, by either attacking Biden or finding other ways to Trump overcome, put down, uh, or seriously box in Mr. Biden. My own sense is that in rephrasing the question in those that form, I have said much will depend on where and how uh, this pushback would occur. If it stays in the canal uh, that's sort of now reserved for it, uh, which probably includes hardline measures at home and anti-crowd behavior on the part of the Russian police if it begins to get beyond the bounds of what Mr. Putin feels he can put up with in terms of potential loss of uh, serious popularity, something that has been going on for the last several months and about which he does not seem in the light of the summit to be so entirely uncomfortable that he had to try to make the summit into a let's regain popularity by increasing the hard line on the United States. Uh, so I think the answer will more or less be in terms of both how it is presented and how difficult it becomes and what else may go forward of a positive nature that could offset it and be counterbalancing enough for Biden to want to continue to keep the door open. And so Biden has left himself um, a vague kind of deadline. He didn't say the 31st of December or the end of the year, but he did say six months he would want to take a look at it, which I think by its nature gives him some flexibility to make that decision when he wants to and bring it forward should he begin to feel that there is nothing in this relationship uh, to be gained by seeking either in one or another of the nominated activities they've agreed upon at the summit, or indeed other activities they might agree upon, he can achieve anything. Uh, I think in terms of the pluses and minuses of where he has become, uh, where he has come, I'm sorry, he's brought process forward successfully enough to say that he is at the beginning of the beginning of a bifurcation policy in which he will do what he think he needs to do in the areas where he has very strong opposition to what Russia is doing. Uh, not, uh, 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 put it this way, uh, uh, a certain amount of that will be judged, too, on what he expects the American people will do in reaction to what Mr. Putin is doing. He has an election coming up in 2022. Uh, no president forgets the fact that either he has to be reelected or his successor of the same party has to be elected, and therefore his method of proceeding, his way of formulating foreign policy, his approach to it uh, does play a role in that, even if, in fact, domestic policy traditionally trumps foreign policy in that regard. Uh, so there is a flexibility about this that he himself uh, can um, uh, uh, assume in whatever way he wants to uh, in terms of organizing it. He's left himself with exit ramps, uh, maybe not as many as he would like, but enough in terms of his flexibility, uh, not, I think, to be caught in a box.
Thank you very much, Ambassador, for that answer. And I think our next question is from Marguerite. Um, thank you, Ambassador Pickering, for taking the time to speak with us again. Um, I'm reading Russian and East European Studies at the University of Oxford, um, but I'm from the US and I have a question that um, more so about domestic politics um, or intergovernmental um, communication. Um, I'm wondering, did Trump's kind of discrediting or attacking at the legitimacy of US, inter, um, US governmental agencies have a lasting impact on them? And if so, does it actually um, translate into less confidence or a fundamental change in the way that, in, that governmental agencies interact now with the president and maybe communicate issues um, on our region of interest, for example? Thank you. Well, Marguerite, thank you. Another, I think, extremely good question and, and thank you for it. Uh, I would say the following. It had its primary negative impact at the time that it was, in fact, expressed by President Trump because he was, after all, the then elected president of the United States. Uh, and the agencies, the analysts at the intelligence community, uh, but I also am very familiar with the State Department in which uh, Secretary Tillerson, for one, at the beginning of his term in particular, uh, went after State Department employees and forced a number of them to resign, contrary to U.S. law, but something that was not possible to bring him to Brook on. And Pompeo, over a period of time, began initially by trying to impress the employees he had their interests at heart, but in the end, both in his selection of policies, which he was perfectly free to do, and to some extent by his neglect, if I could put it that way, of the employees, their points of view, and his interest in them, uh, and he would certainly dispute this, uh, also left them feeling uh, as if they and the State Department as an institution was somehow uh, on a sideline course to nowhere, if I could put it that way, rather than uh, being brought in uh, to the center of American foreign policy efforts. And so with the uh, movement onto the scene of the Biden administration, that has begun to change. Now, uh, much of that is still influenced by the long period of time that it is taking for the Biden administration both to appoint individuals, but even more importantly, to get them confirmed in the Senate. The Senate has been very slow. Someone mentioned to me last week there were only four confirmed individuals in the State Department. I found it hard to believe, but it could be true. Uh, and that there are other individuals who do not need confirmation who are acting. And many in acting capacities, uh, partly as a result of uh, what job they held at the end of the Trump administration, and partly as a result into the acting, into appointments into acting capacities by the Biden administration, but others are in line to be confirmed for those jobs. So that produces a certain amount of what I would say deep uncertainty throughout a major department of government, which is certainly not yet fully dispelled despite the fact that I would say without reservation uh, that Department of State employees that I have been in touch with, and that's a fair number, are quite satisfied with the range of appointments. They're very satisfied as opposed to the Trump administration with the number of career people have been proposed for assistant secretary level and deputy assistant secretary level appointments. They're quite satisfied with the diversity and indeed the diversity probably far exceeds what any other administration does has done in the proposal of individuals from diverse backgrounds of all sorts uh, for senior level jobs in the State Department. I suppose if there is any disappointment, it is probably among the old traditional white male so-called wasps who are hopeful always about jobs and looking forward to them and generally have been well treated in the past, but now are understanding that uh, diverse candidates are going to be respected given 
real opportunities to perform and have a equal uh, opportunity, maybe even better than that as a way uh, to move the department into kind of the diverse organization that people ideally have seen it uh, and want to see it be. So that's perhaps a long answer to your question, but it is a complicated and difficult question with many facets to it. And I think it will be a while before that can happen. One would hope, however, that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee would take more seriously and be more engaged in approving individuals uh, for these appointments that a Democratic majority in the Foreign Relations Committee and a Democratic uh, bare majority in the uh, Senate as a whole uh, could be made to operate perhaps intensively on one calendar day a week uh, doing a whole series of confirmations rather than one at a time spread out over a very long period of time and spend its time as well doing hearings if it wants to. In the past, uh, Congress often waived hearings with individuals whose record they admired and who, uh, with whom they had every reason to believe uh, would perform well. But with the polarization in the Congress now also reflected both in the Senate and in the committee, that seems to be very hard to do. And the minority, while it does not have uh, an absolute right of veto, has a role to play. And the minority can slow things down. Uh, but slowing things down just to irritate the majority or to undermine its electoral chances while it is now seemingly something that is in fashion, if I could put it that way, is something which I would hope over time responsible senators in both sides would decide is neither in the interests of the United States nor in the preservation of peace and security for our country or promotion of its prosperity. Thank you. Um, Tina. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Ambassador Pickering, for being with us once again. Um, my question is related to a segment that we were all in together previously with uh, Professor Anatole Levin, and he was discussing climate change in the nation state. And basically, his, his book and his work was advocating, if, if, if I may summarize, um, using nationalism as a vehicle to engender more climate change activism. And I was wondering if you think, thinking about the pluses and minuses of Biden's approach, would you agree that one minus is not tapping into the, I guess, virtues of nationalism as cohering this community for a certain issue such as climate change? Or do you think this is inherently a very perilous um, path to take for a president to, in, in some ways, unleash some sort of nationalism uh, in the nation to, if, and it's a slippery slope. So I was just wondering if, how you would conceptualize that approach and if it's um, applicable to, to our society now. Uh, Tina, another extremely good question. Thank you very much. And not an easy one to answer. My own sense is that um, foreign policy in many ways as many uh, different facets to it. Uh, but in the end, the best policies could be summed up as those which serve American interests the best. And then you have to say where there is clearly uh, uh, across the country a strong sense of unity about what those interests are. And that means that the leadership of the party in power in particular has to be both aware of their uh, capacity uh, to articulate and select the national interest and explain it in a way that is, in every sense of the word, as convincing as they can make it. And the more they leave it behind, and this was 
certainly one of my principal complaints about the Trump administration, the less likely they are to build a consensus or indeed to achieve objectives. And certainly working with national interest, the idea has to go beyond rhetoric toward actions and activities that are plainly seen to have supported and prospered the national interest however they may be seen as domestic or foreign or some elision of both in what is being done. Uh, and this means, in effect, that national interest and nationalism can be elided together as part of a common effort in a way that, in my view, is both respectable uh, and acceptable. On the other hand, if in fact uh, they are portrayed as me first and diktat and always the America view wins and we're not interested in how other people see it, we're only interested in their support and we have a tendency to move into the world with the fact that not only is America back but America is deciding and America has the exclusive responsibility to do this and this is America's uh, central purpose in being in the world, uh, the worse it gets. And so there is a way of handling nationalism in my view that is both considerate uh, and uniting and there is a way of handling nationalism that is both deeply inconsiderate and very effective in both bringing the United States together around a solution and in many ways turning off the, those countries around the world and those people around the world who consistently look at the United States, examine it uh, for where they believe we are going and make constant judgments about whether uh, we are uh, doing what it is that's in the interest of the world community as well as ourselves, and those can be brought together. And I think uh, Biden is struggling uh, with doing it that way rather than the alternative way of saying basically, well, I am the president, I've decided this is the way it's going to go, and I'm telling you how it's going to be, uh, but failing in one way or another, obviously, to get anything done. Uh, which has been a little bit the characteristic of the past four years before the inauguration. So I think with respect to climate change, countries have concerns and they run the gamut, but many of those have to do with if I live on the coast, will my house uh, and indeed my backyard be drowned? Uh, if I live near the coast, will the floods that come that I expect the aseasonal uh, variations brought on by climate change be helpful or destructive? If I deal in agriculture, will we get more or less rain? Will we get more or good growing seasons? Will we get better uh, and more useful treatment of the soil? Uh, will I have a strong market for what I'm going to produce or a weak market? and so on. Uh, even among our military, I think there should be and there are uh, deep worries. Will our base areas be wiped out or will we be able to continue to use them? Uh, will weather patterns and weather change make our uh, own uh, capacity to be effective as a military less strong, weaker, uh, or, the vice, or, the, or the alternative, vice versa. Those are the kinds of things that need to be built into a pattern of presenting the policy. And I think at the moment, uh, John Kerry, who is the president's new czar for the policy, is deeply engaged in the international part of dealing with this issue. But I think sooner rather than later, Tina, he will have to come to grips with how and in what way the American public is seeing this. We have not discarded entirely the chimera uh, that somehow there is no real climate change. 
that this is all made up by people who want to control our lives from the central government in Washington and have these ideas that they can use to try to sell what is going on here uh, in a way that puts them uh, inevitably and uh, ineluctably in permanent charge uh, forever of how and in what way we deal with things, or alternatively, uh, is it something that he and the president, through very careful preparation and careful explanation, can explain to us, not so much in the basis that the sky is falling and we have to prop it up, but so much that if we do not take care and we do not look after our natural resources and indeed all of the things that will be affected by climate change, uh, we are in effect uh, failing uh, to do our national duty uh, for the country, for all of its inhabitants, and for the world community in general. And that's the direction in which we have been moving, and it seems to me that's a useful direction. So like a lot of questions of this sort, much depends upon how you in one way or another frame the answer, uh, present it, uh, argue it, uh, and defend it uh, with the American public. And communication is a great tool of national diplomacy. Uh, and the center of communication lies with the president and the people who are closest to the president in making these points, but they should play a strong role in how and in what way we shape the policies we adopt as well. We can adopt policies that are unpopular if we in fact can explain why we have adopted it and why they are in effect uh, the best of a lot of worst choices, which is often the case in foreign policy, often the case in domestic policy. You don't have a lot of ideal answers lying around on the shelf waiting to be chosen. If they're ideal, they would have already been chosen and not presented uh, the hard problems that in one way or another tax policymakers today. Thank you so much. John, would you like to go? Yeah, if, if no one else has, oh, Alex has a question, you can go. Oh, thanks, John. Um, and thank you, Ambassador Pickering. Uh, once again, I'm, I'm Alex Carlier, student at Middlebury Institute of International Studies, uh, studying international policy. Um, Ambassador Pickering, is the concept of leadership overestimated? Uh, after all, Russia hears leadership from President Biden and receives U.S. hegemony and not necessarily the word leadership? Um, or is it vitally important in American civic life and we just need leadership that motivates and inspires action for challenges like public health and climate change before we seek to export it uh, as a foreign policy. Thank you. Uh, Alex, thanks. It's good to see you again. Um, again, uh, two very important questions is um, uh, leadership, uh, the careful uh, judgment about how and in what way wisely lead to lead the country uh, or is it sort of recklessly, nationally, uh, triumphantly determined as being uh, something that uh, is being sought after for purposes of self-promotion? Uh, and obviously the former seems to me uh, to be the logical and reasonable approach and the latter not so. There's no question at all that Mr. Putin very clearly sees uh, U.S. leadership as an effort toward hegemony. And there's no question that I suspect that in Beijing there are many of the same conclusions. And we ought to be ourselves extremely alert to the question that if they see those things that way, and we see their efforts very much in the same pattern, the same mold, uh, we are then taxed uh, with an enormously difficult problem to overcome. How can we 
in one way or another convince those people that we have the best interests in mind in what we are doing. And how can we, in one way or another, convince them that uh, we have a common interest in this problem and we will both survive or fail if it doesn't happen. Interestingly enough, uh, fairly clearly on, at the beginning of the Cold War, uh, there was enough realization of the fact, perhaps most clearly following the Cuban Missile Crisis, that if we allowed the nuclear genie uh, to get out of the bottle and had an exchange of nuclear weapons, there was little or no way we could assure that that exchange would be finite, that it would be ended, that we would each have a chance of recovering, and that planetary destruction was not the inevitable result, as I think we came to conclude, uh, particularly in the worst of times, where we had little in the way of basic agreement to move things ahead. And the tearing up in the recent period of time of arms control arrangements which were provided for some of that stability, none of them perfectly and all of them with fault and all of them deserve to be repaired, has been a dangerous course which has opened us up a great deal more uh, to the question of is our uh, leadership sufficiently wise, sufficiently prescient, uh, sufficiently balanced uh, to be able uh, to deal with problems on which the only answer uh, for survival is win-win, not zero-sum. Um, and we have fallen back into a zero-sum mentality, uh, which in my view is very dangerous and lost sight of the win-win as being a deep reflection of the necessity for common purpose for survival. And survival is a great teaching tool. And in fact, as I may have mentioned to you earlier, because I say this often, when asked, Harry Truman uh, once said, America only has two vital interests, survival and prosperity. Uh, and I think he quite seriously had thought through this. This was not something off the top of the head uh, of the moment. And in a situation where other nations have a role in determining survival, you have to pay attention to other nations. And the best you can do is obviously to say that survival is a shared question and that if we do not share the answer, we are inevitably condemned to not having an answer and that we, two nations or more, uh, could be the root cause of the failure both of getting the answer, but uh, even more importantly, having the negative results uh, eventuate of failing to get the answer. And so it is very important that uh, leadership uh, begin to open the door to mutual respect and to mutual capacity to listen and to hear. And for diplomats, listening is perhaps much more important than talking, despite the fact that they're always graded, if I could put it this way, on what they say and not what it is they hear well. But telling your government what you've heard well is, in my view, as important or more important than telling your government what you said well. Uh, and hearing well is the first uh, source of good information both from a leader and a good diplomat on what it is that you need to address with friends and enemies as a way of bringing along uh, a set of conclusions and compromises uh, that can build a structure of stability rather than a structure of uncertainty and conflict and contention, all of which I think is in our interest. It doesn't mean compromise at any price. It doesn't mean all compromises are acceptable. It doesn't mean that contention does not play a role in driving toward compromise, but it does mean that 
the further you go down the road of using military force, particularly in a war of choice, the harder it is to get out of that problem and the harder it is to solve the issue. Uh, and the notion that military force is the quick and easy way to resolve diplomatic problems is, uh, again, uh, taking you down the false road uh, that force equals simplicity. We have found, and we are still engaged in two 20-year wars, more or less, that the battlefield victories that we achieve on a regular basis in these 20-year wars do not translate into political arrangements that bring about a resolution either in our favor or in favor of our enemy. They bring about another effort to move toward another battle. Uh, and the military are trained to win battles, but not to confect, uh, uh, carry out, uh, shape, or order uh, political settlements, which are indeed the end of conflict, whether you win or lose. There is a political settlement either in your interest or not in your interest. And so diplomacy takes that on. Just a few other words. Good leadership is avoiding uh, going uh, down a road uh, from which you cannot escape. And the use of force to support yourself has to be, in my view, very wisely chosen and very carefully uh, presented and very carefully used. If you do not have a negotiating process in being, and you choose to use force, there is no alternative at the end of the day uh, should you fail, and force often fails to produce a solution, to have either to back away or to use more force. And more force means a larger war, and a larger war means a harder problem to solve. Backing away means that you have to admit failure uh, and you cannot bring the other side uh, along with a solution if you have failed. So diplomacy plays a hugely critical role in that mid-space between doing nothing uh, and using excessive force. And so I remain permanently committed against wars of choice. I think it is perhaps the worst solution that we can go into. I remain respectful of diplomacy but not so admiring that I think it can solve every problem. But I do believe that we should do and try and work hard at diplomacy on a continuing basis uh, in favor uh, and in preference to using force uh, to try uh, to work out a satisfactory outcome of deep problems we have with other countries. Thank you very much for that answer, um, Ambassador Pickering. Um, if I could ask another question, unless anybody else has one, I, I don't see any questions at the moment. We've so far talked a lot about what um, the U.S. can do, what Biden is doing, what they might do in six months, how Congress plays into this. I was wondering if I could get your opinion as to how other countries play in to Biden, the U.S. approach to U.S. Um, Russia policy. We, we've seen an attempt, I think, was it Macron and Mer uh, Merkel trying to uh, reach out to Putin to have a summit that was quickly shot down by, by other um, EU leaders. There's an incident in um, naval incident with the British uh, ship near Crimea that seems to indicate some desire by, uh, uh, for Britain to play a role in, in, in Russia um, relations on the global scale. How do these countries really fit in the picture and with Biden's plan? Thanks, Jonathan. I, another really good and, and I think well-pointed question. My old feeling is that uh, having proclaimed we are back and having made a major effort at the successive summits leading up to the Geneva meeting with Putin, it is very much a requirement for the United States to be in very intense and regular touch with our key friends and allies, talking about next steps 
talking about which direction to go, talking about the things we might do. Uh, some of those steps will include, for example, in the arms control area, uh, how do we get to the next iteration of the reduction of nuclear weapons and delivery vehicles? The Obama administration posed the objective as being perhaps as little as 900 deliverable weapons on both sides. Others have suggested, too, that we also bring down the number of reserve weapons and weapons in the process of being dismantled over a period of time. So instead of five or 6,000, we're in a much lower level than we have been. We need to work with our friends and allies about the new technology that's being ventured both by Russia and by us uh, into the delivery of nuclear weapons. Uh, we need, once again, to examine the very large program that we backed into in uh, refurbishing our nuclear weapons and delivery vehicles. Uh, we need to have uh, the capability, and we need to have near certainty about that capability, uh, but uh, spending trillions of dollars over a period of time without at the same time complementing that expenditure uh, with further reductions and agreements on how and in what way uh, we might control uh, weapons and delivery vehicles is, uh, again, a serious mistake. We have left a huge gap in the area of intermediate range weapons and tactical weapons have never really been considered seriously conventional weapons uh, between the U.S. and Russia and the U.S. and China uh, need to be looked at just in that one field alone. Uh, we have other things to do. Cyber has certainly uh, been previously mentioned. And one can imagine that if cyber has the capability of wrecking our economies, and seemingly it does, then each of us ought to be very much aware of the necessity to behave ourselves in unleashing cyber against each other in a way that one way or another inevitably might achieve that result. Not good for us, not good uh, for others, uh, and certainly not good for the globe as a whole. We have huge challenges in trade regulation or in trade negotiations. Uh, we need further to open up free trade, in my view, uh, but we need to do so on a carefully balanced basis. Uh, and each uh, of us, particularly the Ch Chinese and the U.S. have much to offer in a trading relationship uh, as we go down the road. Uh, we have no interest in increasing the number of dictators or autocracies in the world or conferring uh, world hegemony on another power. Uh, we need to be aware of that, but we need to be aware of the fact that the only way to resolve that problem is not a nuclear war between the U.S. and China which seems increasingly to be the intrusive option. And so there are things that require careful thought and conversation and reaction, uh, as well as uh, the uh, putting together of innovative solutions, which are there. We spend too little time in this day and age on solutions. We did more at the height of the Cold War in that direction, and that is badly wanting and something that we need to engage in. It is something we should have a national uh, focused effort to try to produce. At one time, uh, we had a disarmament agency, maybe something along those lines, uh, to work on solutions uh, to these and other problems is wise. Maybe that's something that Secretary Blinken should be paying some attention to, even as he has uh, uh, an essentially to deal with a cascade of near-term, short-term problems as well. Uh, his reputation and the administration's reputation will be as much as what they do long-term as they do short-term. So those are all out there uh, and possible and, and important, and I hope that uh, that will be uh, a useful way uh, to proceed at, 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 at this particularly difficult time. Thank you very much for that detailed answer. And now we have John with, a, with another question. 
Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, so my question actually um, builds a bit on Jonathan's question, then Ambassador Pickering, what you talked about in your response. So to this point of, you know, bringing in allies um, and the idea of working towards solutions instead of just having problems um, and bickering. So I was curious with the, the Nord Stream 2, the decision not to put sanctions on Gazprom, can we can or should we look at that as an attempt to move away from the Trump era America first to an effort to have a more multipolar approach to international relations, you know, not wanting to make Germany mad, letting Russia have its pipeline. And so you keep relations between you know three major powers on a more harmonious note instead of you know sanctioning a pipeline that's almost completed anyway for the purposes of either domestic points or virtue signaling or whatever you want to call it but that more pragmatic multipolar approach do you think that's something we should look for more in the future or was this like more of a, an isolated incident knowing that biden was going to be meeting with putin in the near future uh, great question i don't know the answer to that i would probably tilt on the side that your explanation of possible solutions touched upon that um, Europe needs energy. It needs varying sources of energy. Uh, that up until now, the pipeline went ahead without serious opposition. That opposition to the pipeline seems to be more of the character that uh, fits into the mold of anything but helping Russia rather than necessarily fashioned in a way that can make uh, a Russian energy source into something that is mutually beneficial, if I could put it that way. Uh, and while the pipeline is nearly done, only a few elements need to be put in place for completion, which makes it harder to oppose both because you have aligned Germany and Russia and perhaps a lot of Europe, which will depend on additional offtake from that line, uh, dependent upon it. Uh, it is something that I thought might make some sense to go to the Germans, and maybe we have begun to do so, and say the following. We're uh, prepared not to oppose this line. Uh, we think in the long run it makes sense. Uh, but we'd like to talk to you about making sure that your energy security is also locked up in this in a strong and useful way. And that therefore, as you move down the road with this line, uh, you will continue to take significant quantities of petroleum and gas from the other feeder lines that come in, whether they originate in Russia or in LNG sources elsewhere in the world and so on, and that your expansion of uh, reliance on energy sources will be balanced with renewable energy development on your own, even if it is only a small portion of your needs. And as a result, develop with Germany some kind of informal understanding, and perhaps with the other Western Europeans, about how and in what way they do not become trapped uh, as uh, solely dependent uh, with no alternatives on Russia, while at the same time making the best possible use of Russian gas and oil, and while at the same time perhaps given the fact that there might be flexibility right now in gas supplies, driving forward on pricing structures that will be beneficial as well. So it seems to me that uh, doing things with respect to the Nord Stream pipeline, which are inevitable and which take into account the inevitability of its construction, are okay, but it would be nice as well uh, to be able to balance that with the fact that if I do you a favor, you will do me a favor, and the favors happen to be things that are beneficial to both of us. 
Thank you very much. And uh, we now have a question from Nadia. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you so much for taking your time today to speak to us. I'll briefly introduce myself. Um, my name is Nadia Kaminkovich. I'm currently reading for a master's in Russian East European studies in the University of Oxford. I have a bit like more of a personal question. Um, now everyone is talking about the differences in generations, generation uh, Z, generation Y. And I was interested whether you think that the new generation of dipl diplomats that will come, will it be different from the current one? Um, and will this difference actually influence anything? For instance, if we take Russia, the new diplomats will be born after the Soviet Union collapse. Um, so do you think it actually plays any role? And if, yeah, thank you. Okay, the quality of the audio was a little difficult, but I understand your question, personal one, is that we're now in a period of change and they have a new generation coming on and will we face differences and what can you say about those differences that in one way or another may affect us? Is, is yes. that right or is there a different question at hand? Yeah, it was the question about the change of uh, generation of diplomats, but yeah, I guess you got it right. <laughs> change of di generation of diplomats? Yes. Okay. Well, <laughs> I think um, with change comes change, obviously. <laughs> so it's a hard question to duck in one way or another. How it will change actually is a little different to see. My sense is that uh, for Americans, but perhaps for others, we are hopefully moving toward a more open system, a more liberal system, a more discussable system, a more negotiated system, a more um, comprehensive system system with respect to dealing with problem areas and a system which still uh, can champion values such as freedom and rule of law and, and open markets and things of that sort, uh, but with a suitable and indeed acceptable role uh, for government in carrying out its responsibilities to be sure that it treats its citizens equitably and fairly. Uh, in what's to happen, that things like health and education and treatment of uh, younger people and older people and uh, all of the questions that represent major challenges for us um, in life uh, are dealt with uh, thoughtfully and adequately uh, by uh, government resources, however they're mobilized, uh, and that over a period of time uh, we can do a better job uh, working together to deal with conflicts than we have done. Uh, statistically, the data keeps showing that we have fewer conflicts in terms of press and news, we seemingly have more. <laughs> so, there is a, a kind of um, impingement upon our consciousness of the fact that the world is still not uh, a grand place where we can expect everything to walk off hand in hand in the sunset uh, like the end of a, of a very positive Hollywood movie, but uh, something that increasingly is going to challenge us for diplomats. One hopes it means that we have learned a great deal uh, from the failures of the current and the past and can, as a result, uh, be uh, motivated uh, to push ahead uh, with seeking solutions uh, for some of the grand problems like climate change and, and uh, disarmament and dealing with pandemics and so on. Uh, while at the same time uh, we can continue to build uh, the number of international agreements that in one way or another continue and strengthen our cooperation with each other bilaterally and multilaterally, that we can find a way 
uh, to take our international organization to a new stage. And that may well have been a time that has come, uh, if not past us, in terms of the necessity to do something along those lines. Uh, should we uh, take a look at how and in what way the Security Council might operate better if we were to restrict or limit the veto, not that that will be easy to accomplish because the veto itself uh, will be used to block it, but we do need to think about things of that sort. How and in what way can we build a greater corpus of cooperation uh, in the United Nations system, make peacekeeping more effective, be more useful in early movements to resolve international conflicts of one sort or another, make the World Trade Organization uh, more lively and effective uh, in uh, dealing with trade disputes where decisions should not take 17 years uh, to come to fruition, uh, but perhaps no more than seven months. Uh, we're uh, out there with much to do. So today's young diplomats have an open field and serious challenges. And one hopes that they will engage in thinking about it, that they will have the opportunity in their working relationships with others uh, to try to think through answers, that they will form a group of people dedicated to and devoted to solutions as opposed to contention and arguments, uh, and that they will use all of the tools and all of the instruments uh, at their command and convince their governments that that's the appropriate way to proceed. Uh, so uh, the personal question is answerable in a sense that uh, no one can now purely, completely, and accurately define the future. All we know is that future is always a combination of opportunity and challenge and that I often say diplomacy's major task is to turn challenges into opportunities. And so you have a lot to work with, and you have a lot out there, uh, and new ways of thinking about changing challenges into opportunities uh, should be part and parcel of what you're doing, but you should learn all the basic skills, foreign languages, uh, presentation of issues, how to listen, how to understand what other people are saying, how further to develop uh, answers to problems, and how uh, as salesmen of peace and uh, solutions for the future, uh, you can work within your own governments to convince them that uh, you and they together can produce better answers than you have. Thank you. Um, Yana? Would you like to go next? Thank you very much, Jonathan, and thank you very much, Ambassador Pickering. And uh, my question is um, regarding the consideration that at the present Biden administration faces a number of challenges, both foreign and, of course, domestic. And my question to you is, uh, do you think that the present domestic challenges in the U.S are at all preventing um, effective foreign policy, or if they do not play much role? Um, thank you. Another very good question. I think that our present domestic challenges um, are taking important time and attention of the Biden administration to resolve them. Um, but that increasingly we find that domestic policies and foreign policies intermix. The pandemic is not an American problem exclusively and not one for America exclusively to solve. Uh, we share it with many countries around the world and indeed how fairly to distribute vaccine and how urgently and in a united way we can face up uh, to dealing uh, with all of the techniques that we have out there to deal with the, with the COVID crisis uh, is an important exercise, not only 
in domestic policy formulation, but also in the pursuit of, uh, of useful and valuable foreign policies, that masking is not a one-shot for um, people here, uh, that social distancing is not alone, that the development of therapies, which seemingly has been one of the hardest technical problems of dealing with uh, the pandemic, uh, that the production and administration of vaccines and how to overcome vaccine hesitancy among people around the world uh, in a uh, pandemic that if not dealt with, will continue to be with us and produce new variants to challenge the solutions we already have is something we need to find uh, important ways to get across uh, to people uh, all around the world. Uh, many of our domestic issues in the United States have uh, international application, have international variations in other places around the world and about which it is therefore necessary for us uh, to cooperate together to deal with them. And so uh, I would say uh, coming to this question with a rigid division uh, between domestic and foreign probably is a misapplication of our own good sense. Uh, and uh, we need to be thinking about these questions as part of a congeries of, of challenges uh, that need to be resolved home and abroad. Perhaps more for all of us at home than abroad, and that's not unusual, but uh, the exclusive focus uh, on at home uh, may well just bring back from abroad a problem that uh, we came near to solving at home, but not, uh, we're not totally successful. And the spread abroad is now once again a new source of difficulties for us all. So we've learned a lot from the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic is not exclusively a health problem. It is an economic problem as well. And in the United States, it has helped to uncover, uh, I think, in part by the stress it has put on the American system, our social problem of uh, clearly uh, systemic racism as an affliction of our society with which we have to deal much more cogently and uh, much stronger than we have, and it has applications at home and abroad. It's not hard to think of what they are and how and in what way to deal with them. So uh, uh, I would say, uh, sure, uh, priorities are always important, but we should not forget the realities that help us determine the priorities, and the realities are that we are intermixed. And in fact, people talk of intermestic problems, international problems of a domestic variety that have uh, a natural cohesion between them. Well, speaking of realities, uh, the hard reality is that we're out of time. Um, so if everyone could join me in, in thanking Ambassador Pickering for this wonderful and interesting and, and wide reaching discussion. Um, Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for your moderation and for your questions. And my thanks to all of you for great questions. I've enjoyed being with you very, very much and wish you all the best of luck. And thank you for being a wise and intelligent and clearly a very interesting group of young people to talk to. It's been my honor and pleasure to be with you. And I look forward to hearing great things about your successes in the days, in the months, and the years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you.